Jim Green entered the international market with a splash only a few years ago, despite being a long-established South African bootmaker. Why they have caught the interest of people interested in boots is encapsulated in their Numzan boot. G'day, welcome back to Bootlosophy. My name is Tech. I acknowledge the Wajit people of Nungabuja, the traditional custodians of the lands I record on. Before we start talking about the uh, boot review, I wanted to let you know that this is uh, being recorded early. I usually take about three weeks between researching, uh, writing my running notes or, or full script, filming, editing, uh, doing B-rolls and re-recording stuff-ups <laughs> up to the time I upload. This review and, and those of the next few weeks are being recorded in June. I'm doing a whole load up front because uh, my wife and I are having a few medical challenges over July and August. My wife Amanda has to have a procedure called a catheter ablation to try to fix her atrial fibrillation. Basically, her heart is running too fast and uh, could cause strokes uh, and arrhythmia. So the ablation is going to fix some uh, current to certain areas to shock the heart back into being a good girl. <laughs> She'll be resting for a couple of weeks after that and I'll be looking after her. Then it'll be my turn. I have to uh, have cataract surgery on both eyes a week apart. So for some time, I'll have an eye patch on one eye or the other and my eyesight will be uh, weird for four to six weeks until I get a new prescription. So that will make it hard for me to uh, research the boots on uh, computers, to review uh, uh, and even film, uh, never mind the close focus when I'm editing. So I just wanted to let you know that for the next few weeks, probably until the end of August, I think, the videos you see will have been recorded early. Now, Let's get over to our brother Commonwealth nation, South Africa, where this Jim Green Nomzan boot is made. I believe this boot is only about a year old in their catalogue, maybe not even that, um, or at least I hadn't seen it on their website or in their publicity until quite recently. Nomzan is a Zulu word meaning leader or head of a clan or family. Jim Green's publicity says that this is a do-anything boot, tough enough to go in the bush, but designed in a way that can see it in the office as a casual boot. Uh, just before we go on, this video is not sponsored, but know that I got these boots for free in order to review them, but with no strings attached, no pre-approved uh, wording about what I say. When I look at the Nomzan, my immediate impression is work boot. And then I pause and think, no wait, um, maybe hiking boot or outdoors bush bashing boot like Jim Green's uh, more popular African Ranger. I don't necessarily see it as a casual office boot, but then again, I suppose you have to ask what type of office. It is five and a half inches tall in the shaft from the top of the heel, about 6.7 uh, inches from the bottom. There is a distinctive cap toe where the leather curves backwards across the toe rather than being cut straight across. It has a single piece backstay, but cut a little short at the top where there is a piece of leather that forms the collar portion of the shaft. It sits on a low profile block heel and a low profile sole, which I suppose creates a look that doesn't actually say, I'm wearing hiking boots into the office. The hardware is big and beefy, and the uh, very wide round toe last is very comfortable and work boot like, but it will not appeal to some. This is a jeans and casual clothes boot, uh, if you're not wearing it as a work boot. I think at its more versatile end of the spectrum, uh, perhaps khaki or brown chinos, and I have to say, I don't necessarily see it as a smart or business casual boot that you pair with slim dark pants or dark chinos and uh, button-up dressy shirts and sports coats. Let's talk a bit about Jim Green. Many of my viewers will know of it, but I think many viewers of this video might not because, as I said, it is quite new to the international boot scene and only a few YouTube reviewers have actually handled the pair. Jim Green, the company, is based in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. It's named after Jim Green, the frog, that is indigenous to a fly fishing area in that region. The frog is called Sneaky. 
I don't know why, <laughs> and is apparently eaten by fish, so it's used as bait by fishermen. So not that sneaky. <laughs> Uh, Jim Green the brand has been around from its Crouch family beginnings a long, long time, but in its modern iteration traces back to 1992. The brand reputation in South Africa is based on making tough and rugged footwear. I am told that today it's one of South Africa's most well-known local footwear makers and is worn by, amongst others, farmers and bushmen. They take uh, genuine pride in paying their workers a real wage over and above their national minimum wages. And they take pride not only in making their boots locally, but also using local materials from the rubber soles to the upper leathers. They currently make a number of different models, including the South African chucker boot called a Feli over there, Veli, Veli, uh, because of the heritage Feltshorn construction. Sort of like calling the Clark's desert boot the Desi. <laughs> There's something familiarly Australian about shortening names, you know. Uh, Jim Green are most famous overseas for their African Ranger uh, in a program where they donate one pair to an African Parks Ranger for every 10 boot. And they're also very well known for their Razorback boot. I will leave a, a link to their website below, but also you can check out my review of the African Ranger up here. I mentioned Feldshorn construction earlier. Feldshorn is a Dutch word meaning field shoe, and the Dutch settlers of South Africa brought their sturdy construction methods with them, uh, hence the Feli tra uh, tradition in South Africa. In true Feldshorn, which is very complex, the insole has a, has a gemming or canvas strip attached around the edge of the insole. Uh, then the uppers are flared out and sewn to the welt. And then the welted uppers are attached to the insole through the welt into that gemming. I'm finding it hard to explain it verbally without visual aids, so I will leave a link to a website uh, down below called Find Sourcing, which has an excellent blog article about the differences between stitch down, felt shorn, and another method called San Crispino. At any rate, stitch down is where the uppers are flared out and then stitched directly through the insole without a welt and the outsole. I can't actually see whether this is a stitch down or a felt shorn, but I can't see a welt, so I'm going to call it as stitch down, especially as their description on some of the other boots cite stitch down. So you see here in profile, uh, the upper leather at the top, the midsole, a thin resin layer, and then the outsole. The midsole is leather, as is the insole, and in between is a steel shank for arch support and stability. Yes, the insole is leather, that's one of the updates here. Uh, the outsole is their proprietary low-profile V-bar uh, outsole that they call the frog grip, although you can also opt for the Jim Green lugged sole if you want. Inside the boot, there is no cork filling since without a welt, there is no cavity to fill and that's why I think they use the uh, resin runner for extra comfort. It is resolable, but I think fans of Stitch Down compete with fans of Goodyear welting to say which is more easy to resole if you had the machinery. It is water resistant because the uppers obviously will wick moisture away, but again, fans of Goodyear welting may complain that Goodyear welting is more water resistant because of that extra barrier uh, of the welt. Inside the boot, there is a leather half sock liner put on top of the heel for comfort and uh, I guess protect against uh, nail heads. Moving outside, the upper's leather is a local veg tanned full grain bovine leather. Uh, in this case, the color is called walnut. I can tell you it is super tough and calls for some determined break in, but more of that later. It is over two millimeters thick and the lining which is suede, is itself over one and a half millimeters thick, making most of the boot nearly four mils thick. On top of that, some areas are doubled up uh, with the upper's leather again. The eyelet uh, lace edgings, for example, the heel counter cover, and the toe cap. The toe cap is a real toe cap. That is an extra layer of leather that's sewn on top of a complete vamp piece. The uh, heel and toe stiffeners are thermoplastic, probably celastic, when I first put them on, see the unboxing up there, I couldn't feel my toes under the toe cap. In fact, I couldn't even depress the toe cap. Uh, the tongue is really cleverly put together to provide maximum dust and water cover. 
First, the leather containing the hardware is sewn onto the quarter pieces so that they form an open double layer. Then the tongue's gusset is sewn onto the inside quarter piece so that it's protected. The tongue is semi-gusseted up to the fourth eyelet. When you lace it up, the tongue sort of tucks in between the quarter piece and the piece holding the uh, hardware causing this sort of ridge here and also folds in behind the quarter piece. It's impressive how it's been designed to keep out water and dirt. I think it is worth mentioning the design of two pieces of leather. Uh, first is the toe cap. Where you usually see a straight across the toes toe cap, Jim Green's distinction is the curved toe cap. Second is the use of a piece of leather uh, sewn to the top of the quarters uh, and forming the collar. Now, I'm not sure this functions as anything other than a design choice. In most other boots where you see something like that, it's usually padded, but this is not. It's just a piece of uh, upper's leather uh, attached to the top of the quarters. It does look good for it though. Uh, finally, the hardware, solid and sturdy brass, uh, attached very strongly and not going anywhere. Oh, these laces, by the way, they're my own uh, Latigo leather laces. These, these boots come with Jim Green's usual cotton nylon laces. As the uppers are veg tan, uh, they are tough and from the feel, I think they're finished off with an oil finish. So taking care of this leather is easy and in the style of Jim Green's usual practical ruggedness, not really needing anything too refined. The most important thing is to keep them clean. Sandy grit is the enemy of all leather, capable of drying it out and damaging it in, in a micros microscopic sense. So wipe and brush a lot if you wear it in the dirt. Jim Green says that any shoe polish available from your local store will do. Now personally, I would condition these with something like liquid neat's foot oil or mink oil or some uh, balmy type of conditioner like Smith's uh, or Big Four or the Indonesian Dokken or even Obanoff's oil or grease. Some of those products I mentioned will darken the leather, so user beware. But this is pretty dark leather anyway, and the protection may be more important to you. I suspect whatever product you use, this leather will still provide a patina uh, with variations in color and undertone over time, if that's what you want. I've already used liquid mink oil on this without darkening it too much. And here's the story. When these arrived, they were super stiff. I thought, and as it turned out, the break-in was a terror. I wore them as they came for three days, and while I didn't get blisters or anything, they were incredibly uncomfortable, and I really wasn't looking forward for a two to three week natural break-in. So I applied the Tech-O patented quick cheek break-in procedure. <laughs> now don't be horrified, but I applied very liberally liquid mink oil three times over six days drying them overnight and wearing them the next day. I didn't pour the oil over the boot like Rose Andrew did over his Doc Martens, but I did pour some uh, onto my fingers, like pulled it in my fingers and then liberally rubbed it in. Over those six days, I also applied my ball pin hammer technique. <laughs> While watching TV, and as the mink oil was being you know, absorbed, I put the ball part of the ball pin hammer into the boots and rubbed it against the uh, outside edge of the boot from the inside where it hurt my little toes and the outside knuckle joint. I also flexed the boot over and over again uh, during an enthralling episode of NCIS, or was it FBI Most Wanted? The other thing I do, uh, you see how the line at the back uh, goes quite straight up? Some makers uh, make it like this, whereas others last your boots with a cup at the heel before it straightens. As you break in a pair of boots, that curvaceous bum-like shape starts to appear. So one of the things I do is I bend this part just as I would if you were wearing it and flexing it back and forth. Uh, I'll put the hammer handle in and move it backwards over and over. The hammer massage and flexing was over 30 to 40 minutes each evening while I was watching TV. What we do for love. After that process, I wore them every day for another week. In fact, after that process, they felt way more comfortable and even by the middle of that second week, I think they were broken in. There are still tough parts, the toes. I still can't depress uh, the toe cap at all. Now though, they feel tough but comfy. Underfoot, I find these much more comfortable than my African ranges. 
I think in my review of those and in my review of the Stockman Chelsea boot up here, uh, I complained about how hard uh, the sole was. These are fine. They're not Poro nor EVA soft, of course, but they do feel like my other heritage boots, which were hard, but felt capable of being bedded in. Uh, another thing is the last. As I said, many will call these clown shoes, but there is no denying that a wide round toe is comfortable. There's room for your toes to flex as you walk or kneel. And in this case, unlike the African Rangers, I do not feel pressure on top of my toes. That is despite, clown shoe or not, quite a low profile uh, when you see it in profile. I think a lot of that clown shoe uh, criticism is down to your view of the boots. I mean, you are the only one who actually looks directly down on the boots. Everyone else would tend to be looking at them from an angle. Uh, and if, frankly, anyone is close enough to look directly down at your, at your toes like this, you'd better be kissing them. <laughs> in terms of sizing, they are true to size. I believe they sell these in the US uh, in US sizes, but I got these in UK sizing, true to my UK size at seven and a half, or converted, that's US eight and a half. Now I wear Iron Rangers, uh, Grantstone, Parkers, Knicks uh, in a size eight. I wear Nikes in a size nine. These sell for just under 250 US dollars. So they compare incredibly well with good quality boots of this kind. Uh, like the Red Wing Heritage range, for example, that sell for above 300. In terms of value to price, you know, I think they're incredible. The materials are local South African sourced. And to be honest, uh, certainly don't feel as good as say a, a Vibram V700 sole, uh, and the leather does not feel as finished as Seidel and Wicked and Craig Veg Tans. But they are strong, they are functional, and they will last, I think. So in, in summary, I, I kind of dispute these are uh, uh, smart casual office boots. Uh, coming off the worksite into a builder's office maybe, uh, on very casual Fridays maybe. However, it is a tough outdoor boot. I think you can easily wear this on a worksite. Uh, you can wear this hiking, you can go bush bashing, and these will protect your feet from rocks and turning your ankles. Uh, they'll protect your feet from dust and, and water. It's not the world's most refined boot, but that's not what you'd buy it for. And remember the under 250 price. It's overall a fun, strong boot. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Keep it nice, Keyboard Warrior. Don't forget to click on like and subscribe, okay? Keep watching the channel. Um, until the next time, take care and I'll see you soon.